Well, precious ones, you'd be so kind. Open up your Bibles this morning to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. You know, we are living in a unique time of moral fogginess where wrong is portrayed as right by the institutions we grew up trusting. We grew up trusting the media. Those of you who are old enough, you remember Walter Cronkite? I think they modeled Yoda after his face. He just looked, you know, like this uncle that would be talking to you. But now, we're challenged. But it's making us come back to something that we've always known. Is that the Word of God is the answer to life. Amen? And I want us to take a very grown-up, though I don't believe you're going to have to take your children out, grown-up sermon on how to remain pure in an X-rated society. How do you work it where the majority of marriages fail? Is that your hope for your children? Is that the hope for your life? It was never God's intention. Now I want you to understand, listen to me. Don't run out until you've heard the whole story. Amen? We live in a knee-jerk world. How would they say that? Don't be a snowflake. There's some things that need to be melted off of our lives by the grace of God. But the cure, and we're going to look at the cure to give clarity, is to lift up the person of truth, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, the power of God, through the Word of truth, which is the Bible in your hand, that is inerrant and cannot lie. Amen? You're in good hands with the Scriptures. Now, right as we're going to be moving into this, you ready? One of the, one of the perpetrated deceptive lies that is very popular in our day is simply this. All sins are the same. It's wrong for you to speak on any one sin. All sins are equal. Have you heard that? I want you to understand, Satan whispered that. Okay? Here's what the Bible says about what we're going to be looking at. And we're just going to want to see what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says this, Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. There is a unique consequence and penalty for impurity, for sexual immorality. And we need to understand, and we have watched it spread like a cancer through the populace. We saw it into the presidency, and now over and over it's in the pulpits across America. And so, God's Word is very clear and very plain. If you're looking for a church that wants to be grounded in the truth, and I praise God for the thousands and thousands of wonderful churches across this country, but it's my desire and my hope, and you pray that we will be a congregation, a church, that will look at the Scriptures and agree with God. Amen? And that I'll be a pastor that will do that for you. Thank you. I will take one clap. I will do that. I will, I will do that. So I want us to take a journey. Come on. Let's start in chapter 5. Now we're going to scoot a boot. You ready? All right. If you came for a, a snack, prepare yourself. We're going to get a meal. In chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Got that? 
Pay attention. He says, Lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. I want you to hear me. There is, first of all, there's going to be four major things we're going to look at today. And this passage comes, and he says, first of all, that there's a discretion we need to learn. Write it down and write it big. In verse 2, there's a discretion that you may preserve discretion. Why? Because there are biblical truths that we say, I know that. But in, but in the experience of life, we forget that. We forget it. Everybody's pure until they're tempted and they get twitterpated. And then all of a sudden, things get really foggy. You understand? And so, where are we going to learn? Where are we going to learn wisdom and understanding concerning this whole world of sexual allurement? Because when he says, you don't understand her ways, now he's talking to a son about a woman, but I can flip this and talk about a woman to a daughter to a husband. You understand? Is the biblical principle at play here that he says it's unstable. You think you have it together. I think I have it together, but we don't. That the, that the world of, of sexual allurement is incredibly deceptive and blinding. And we have to come back to the Word of God. Where are your children? Really, when they leave your home, where are they going to learn moral purity? They're going to learn it from the, from the movies? Dirty movies? Do you realize that over 20,000 examples of sex acts are portrayed on television a year? 20,000. Where are they going to learn it? From the government that sponsors baby butchers of Planned Parenthood? In a media that's in, engrossed into, into a desire that milita militarizes themselves against purity, against marriage? Oh, beloved, listen to me. If you think I'm being extreme, just do this. Before you come talk to me after church, wait a week and put to test what I've told you. Put to test what I've told you. As you watch television, you come back and tell me how many, how many times a church was mentioned on television and how many times it was mentioned positively. You would think there's no churches in America. And we're so afraid of this woke environment that we're afraid to speak truth. If you speak too much, you get knocked off the airwaves. I got it. I got it. But I do want us to understand that they push an agenda that says it's possible to have an immoral life. They'll even say, well, whose morality? I'm going to tell you right now, it's God's morality. It's God's morality. <laughs> if you think I'm going to back up on that, you're wrong. I'm no man's enemy. Brother, look, you think I lived a pure life before I was saved? But the challenge is simply this. Who are you going to get? Who are you going to believe? This is what is pushed. That... Purity really doesn't matter, and that you can live an impure life without guilt. Although the, a majority of our people are on antidepressants right now in this country of adults. But they'll tell you, you can live it without guilt, and you can live it without a baby. You don't have to have one, and if you have one, you can get rid of it. Or if you have it out of wedlock, we'll pay you money. 
whatever you like. There's no problem with that. And also, disease. They don't talk about disease, do they? Or in the commercial that you'll see sometimes on television, I've, I found this intriguing. I've, I, I, I don't watch television, real television, but every once in a while some commercial will sneak in. And they're talking about this horrible sexual disease, and they're riding a bicycle. And they got this sweet music, and in this pleasant voice, they're just telling you, yeah, it's going to eat your body up. But in this medicine, don't worry, it only has a few side, side effects like sudden death. Some years ago, I had to take a medication. They were trying to save me. And it wasn't related to this. It was related to my jungle fever <laughs> from doing missionary work. And they said, listen, we got this new medicine. You know, we think it'll help. And I said, okay. And I read it. And number four on common side effects was sudden heart stoppage. I don't know about you, but that sounds like dead. <laughs> I just, but it sounds so pleasant. Uh, just. <laughs> so what did I do? I didn't fuss anybody. I mean, you take these wonder drugs and then you wonder what they do. I got it. I got it. Everybody was trying to be good. So do you understand? Brother, it's the word of God. Look, there's a discretion we need to learn. Two things. I want you all to hear me. Two things. First of all, number one. From discretion... You can't forget it, because you're going to forget it if you're not anchored in the Word of God. That's the power of our sin in us and the deception that comes. First of all, God has provided direction. Direction that we're to follow. It's a clear path through the Scriptures. It's the only book that speaks wisdom and understanding. Let me tell you what the Bible says. In Proverbs 6.32, it says, Whosoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding they lack understanding can you amen doesn't make them cool it doesn't it may get them a hundred thousand followers on whatever tweeting what stuff but god says you're just clueless Hebrews 13, 4 says, marriage is honorable among all, not just among Christians, but among all. And the bed is undefiled. But fornicators, those who have sex before marriage, and adulterers, those who have sex outside of marriage, God will judge. Can you amen that? God is telling you. In 1 Corinthians 6.13, the Bible says this, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. You see, it's a clear direction. I'm supposed to stay pure. It's not God keeping me from sex. It's God saving me so I can enjoy sex the proper way. And that's between a husband and a wife. A husband and a wife. It is a sacredness that God has created and protects. Amen? Really. And that God brings it. It's a shame. There was a time when the preachers would say, God says. Then they kind of got squirrely on the Bible, many of them, and started saying, the church says. And now far too many just scratch their heads and say, well, it seems to me, beloved, just do this. In Psalm 119, 89, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Amen? The word of God is settled. So God provides direction we need to follow. This is the discretion that you need to learn. Why? Because when you fall in love and you're, you're moving and you're going through, things get shaky. It's wrong. It's always wrong. Number two, God provides a distance we must keep. Look at verses seven and eight. 
He says, therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from my words of my mouth. He comes again. He said, don't depart because you're going to want to. You're going to want to. He says, remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. You know, in my humble but highly accurate opinion, one of the things that I saw when I graduated high school, in my graduating class, there was only one family that I knew that was divorced. There may have been more, but there was only one in the whole pack. Of my graduating class, almost everyone has been divorced. Many, multiple times. What happened? May I make a suggestion? We started going steady. We started going steady. You didn't just go on dates anymore. You started going steady. And you spent an unbelievable amount of time together, alone time together, and you started pretending like y'all were married. And that brought temptations that nobody wins. See, that's why the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says, flee useful lust. Listen to me, listen to me well, parents and adults. Sexual allurement cannot be won by being in the presence of it and praying and reading the Bible. Do you understand? You know how many Christians have fallen, adult Christians have fallen into fornication because they're in a Bible study to go, well, we're, you know what I mean? We like each other. We're just going to read the Bible together and they go into a holy cuddle. Do you understand? Look, God says this is a sin you cannot stand and fight and win. He said, how do, you, how do you find victory in this? You flee. You have to set, saturate the place with your absence. You can't be alone in those kind of situations. It's going to lead to failure. Now, you can argue with me if you want, but please don't. But I'm talking to the men right now. Sir, you should not be alone with females at your work. Do you understand? Don't do that. Don't get into intimate conversations, ladies, with other men. As you're getting comfortable and moving, it's danger. It's danger. The measure of my resolve, I took it serious. A man walked me through this early in my ministry. And he convinced me, and I, and I have been blessed by it. There is not a woman in this church that I call by her first name alone. She is always miss. She's always miss. Why? Because there has to be a distance. Because in the ministry, we're around too many women. Don't ever let anyone from the opposite sex talk to you about their, about their sexual struggles in their marriage. It's inappropriate. Ladies, you need to talk to somebody, talk to another lady. Find a godly lady and talk to her. Guys, just be quiet. <laughs> Amen? Talk to God. Talk to God. Listen, there is, that's, that's a discretion we need to learn. Number one, your body's not to be immoral. Can you amen that? Number two, there's a distance we need to keep. There's a distance we need to keep. Number, th number two, there's a discretion we need to learn, but there's a deception we need to avoid. Let's, let's peel this onion a little bit deeper. A deception we need 
to avoid. Look at verses 3 and 4. God's Word says, For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Guys, here's Satan's plan of his deception. First is allurement, then a entrapment, and then enslavement. Here's how it works. You ready? Here's how he works his plan. First of all, it begins with flirting. And I'm talking about marriage people right now, married people right now. It begins with flirting. The Bible says the lips of a strange woman drip like a honeycomb. Let's call her honey lips. See, men are so silly that they are taken aback like an ox to slaughter. Ladies, y'all don't have, y'all looking like, I don't know what he's talking about. Of course you do. But God says, watch what you say. Sir, you want to flirt with a female? Flirt with your wife. Until you straight, until you open. You're in the office. <laughs> Watch out with that silliness. You don't got to be a prude, but it begins with flirting. It leads to flattery. It leads to flattery. It's a progression. Just like if you go, come on. If you go to the beach here, you put your stuff on the beach and you get out and you're just frolicking in the water, having fun, right? Every once in a while, one of them little fish come and nibble on you, you know, and, and, and you're just bouncing around and not too deep because you don't want the shark to get you. But then you look and your stuff is over here. You've moved to the West. You never felt it, wasn't a riptide, but the current always flows to the West here because that's where the pass is. The water wants to go this way. And I am telling you, there is a direction that a current that moves you and it starts with flirting and it goes to flattery. Goes to flattery. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 24, he says, be careful to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. And it works both ways. Men will flatter. And here's, and here's how you know you're getting caught. You ready? Somebody's marriage is going to be saved here. Here's how you know you're in trouble. Because you're talking with him, and it's so easy to talk with her and talk with him. And then you start saying, oh, I wish, my, I wish my husband understood me like he does. Oh, I can't, I can't really talk to my wife. Oh, I wish my wife praised me up and down and looked at me as though I was some kind of knight. Do you understand? That's flattery. It begins to deceive us. Little flattery makes big fools out of little men. It begins with flirting, moves to flattery, and it always concludes in fatality. It's going to end badly. It fascinates, then it assassinates, always. It puts to death joy, purity, happiness, holiness. God comes, he says, you need to understand. Not only, not only is there discretion, we need to learn but there's a deception we need to avoid. Amen? But not, number three, I need to hustle, don't I? It doesn't stop there. There's a damage. There's a damage we will suffer if we don't obey God's word. Watch what he says here. I want you to, sh once you move through this, watch what God warns us against. And this world will not teach it, and they, although they experience it. First of all is dissipation. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9 and 10. He says, Remove yourself far from it, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. 
lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Here's what he's talking about. There's dissipation. It's going to cost you, pal. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you terrible. It's going to cost you your wife. It's going to cost you your children. It's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost. It's going to cost. There's dissipation. You don't, when, when Satan's got you moving in that way, it's amazing how we don't think about that. That's the, that's the power of Satan. God says it's going to dissipate. You know who's going to get your wealth? An attorney. But number two, it leads to disease. It doesn't stop there. He says, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. It leads to disease. I'm just going to say this. The government website, which plays down these things, I believe, said in February 20. 21, that there are 110 million STD infections. 110 million. There are four sexually transmitted diseases. There's no cure. There's no cure. There's a new one that's just come out. He's not even number four. He's just so brand new. It rots your body. It is a horrible, terrible thing. The, the Bible is very clear. 110 million infections. Active walking around. They es estimate one in five. One in five. The challenges, there's a cost. We talk about COVID, and COVID is bad. This is devastating. It costs. There's dissipation, there's disease. How about verse 12? There's disappointment. And you're going to say, how have I hated instruction in my heart, despised correction? You're going to come, we're going to come. In this immorality, we come to the day where we despise that we ever did it. As one man said, you can eat the devil's corn, but he'll always choke you on the cob. There is dissipation, there's disease, there's appointment. How about the next one? Disgrace. He said, I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. What is he talking about? He's talking about what Jesus said in Luke 12, 2. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. It brings disgrace. I don't care how secret, one day it's going to be known. Your spouse will know it. Your children will know it. Your friends will know it. Your parents will know it. There'll be no place to hide. Say, Brother Dennis, I'm so glad I came to church today. I'm glad you're here. Amen? Let me tell you, this message is desperately needed because we live in a sex-soaked society. And these messages are not heard except in the pulpit. And they're not heard often enough in the pulpit. Guys, I'm not bashing sex. Beck and I have eight children. Self-evident. Do you understand? But there is a horrible consequence. Not the beautiful side of evil that is portrayed. There's dissipation, disease, disappointment, disgrace. How about this one? Verse 22, dominion. He says his own iniquities entrap the wicked man and he's caught in the cords of his sin. How many folks have tried to walk away from pornography and find you got a problem? You try to break off something and you realize, you know what? I'm, I'm tied. The world says there's no cure. I'm telling you, Jesus sets you free. 
And he also restores marriages. Amen? I can go on, but I need, I'm running out of time. There's so much, so much we come. There's a, there's, and God cares. See, that's the beautiful side. God wants you to have a holy, happy life. God wants, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. What that means is, I've come to give you a life the way God wants it. And it is filled with beauty. But to do that, number one, what? There has to be a discretion we need to learn. First of all, number one, fornication and adultery is wrong. It's always wrong. It will always be wrong. I don't care. When I first came to Midway 30 plus years ago, I hadn't been here long. A person walked in my little office. They said, uh, one of you Sunday school teachers told their class that it's okay if you have sex together as long as y'all love each other. And I said, nah, they did not say that. And he said, I'm afraid so. I said, well, okay, thank you very much. And I went talk, and that's exactly, exactly what they said. And if you think this is the first time I've ever preached this sermon, I can pull the tape from 1994. Because the Word of God never changes. Amen? Now, what was really wonderful, I laid it all out. Her and her husband were right there. And, and man, the conviction of God filled the room. They said, now I see the truth and their eyes filled with tears and their lips quivered. None of that happened. They got mad and went to another Baptist church. <laughs> Tragically. But it doesn't matter. The word of God stands forever. God comes and there's a discretion we need to learn. And in that there's direction and distance. There's a deception we need to avoid. Or if we don't, there's a damage we'll suffer. But now I want to turn the corner to the blessings of Almighty God. There's a design we must follow. Amen? I want you, I want you, to, I want you to begin reading with me. In verse 15, he says, Drink water from your own cistern. And running water from your own well. He's talking about your wife. He's likening her to a cistern. Don't go steal any other water. Verse 16. He says, Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own, and not for a stranger with you. Let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. You know, it was years before I could read that in public. <laughs> and always be enraptured with her love. Amen? That's a big word. Enraptured. Enraptured. Sir, I want, to look, I want you to look at me. If you stop kissing your wife, get your lips back in practice. I'm serious. I'm serious. If we're not careful, we're going to be like an old couple. He was sitting on his chair and she was sitting on the sofa. And he couldn't hear too well. You know how that goes. And he looked and he looked at her, and she said something, and he said, what? And she said, you remember when you used to sit by me on the sofa? He got up. Took a while. Walked over, sat on the sofa. Oh. Then she said, whispering to him in a loud voice, 
Remember when you used to put your arm around me? And he grabbed his arm because he's got a bad shoulder. And he picked it up with this one, got it around, put it. And then she said, the wives never stop. But God created them for love. That's why the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. God made your wife to be loved. Love her. Love her. Love her. Amen? And he put his arm, and then she said to him, You remember when you used to nibble on my ear? He pulled his arm back. Got out of the sofa, starts walking. She says, don't leave mad. He said, woman, I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> you got to work at it. Amen. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. See, there's four things. Let's do it and let's do it right now. You ready? This is God's pattern. This is the design we must follow. First of all, have a biblical marriage. A biblical marriage. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Guys, there's a man and there's a woman. In the Hebrew, it says, God created the man a man and he created the woman a woman. I want you to look at me and I'm going to tell you, and this will be for a sermon of another day. Sir, you have no feminine side. God did not create you with a feminine side. Why? Because if he did, your feminine side would fight against your wife. My wife is fully feminine. She's the completer of me. Every wife in this room knows one of her major jobs when she's married is to civilize her husband. Right? That is part of the process. They come. Look what he says in Genesis 2.22. He says, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from Adam, he made into a woman and brought her to him. And Adam said, This is now bone of my man. He saw her as a gift which she was, and he burst into song. In the Hebrew, it's a song. He says, you're now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she's going to be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then the Bible says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and the wife, and they were not ashamed. Amen? Brother? If Adam would have rejected Eve, there was no alternatives. Do you understand? The whole transgender statement is because of a sin sickness. And Jesus can fix that. The whole homosexual lesbian sin is an abomination from Almighty God. The Word of God that stands forever says that in Romans chapter 1. To come back, it's a man and a woman together forever. Go back and read what Jesus said in Matthew 19. Amen? It's a biblical marriage. Number two, God wants you to have a loving mate. A loving mate. Going back, verse 18. He's let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. A loving spouse. Amen? You fell into love, you fell out of love, you can fall back into love. It takes a lot of, a lot of selfless forgiveness, forgiving. Just remember that. Love your spouse. Love your wife. Amen? That's what God says to do. But you don't know her. Adam had Eve. You remember what she did? 
right? But you don't understand how dysfunctional our, our family is, really? Can you imagine their talks around the supper table? Dead. Can you tell me the story about how you and mom got us thrown out of the garden? I love that one. God's grace covers and allows life. It's a loving marriage. It's a lasting marriage. A lasting marriage. It says the wife of your youth. You know what God says when a man divorces in later life, the wife he married when he was young? It's treachery. Go back and read Malachi. You're not supposed to throw your wife aside for the next little chickadee that comes along. God says, love the wife of your youth. Amen? Oh, I praise God that love never fails. My body fails. But love should grow. And then the last one is this, as Brother Braylon takes his place, is a liberating marriage. He says, don't be bound in the cords of sin. Husband and wife should have a freedom and a love together that beats anything you're going to find anywhere else. Say, Brother Dennis, I don't, I don't have that in my marriage. Then come to the Lord. If God promised it, God will empower it. Amen? How long did you pursue your wife before she said yes? I, I hear that happens. Beck pursued me. <laughs> no, that was the Cajun way. The Cajun way, the girls were make, deciding at 15 years old back then who was going to be their husband. And when I met Beck in my senior year, I'm just trying to tell you, we all start from somewhere and we need to help at Jesus. Amen? And this is not a place of shame. It's a place of it's a place of coming to the Lord and moving in a more glorious day. But I remember, I remember like it was yesterday. Jules Melanson was at my house and I had met Beck and I had waited a few days. I had sent out feelers and let it be known in the school that I was interested in this girl I, I saw. And I waited about three days, maybe four days, and she never called. That was unheard of. And so I told Jules, I said, she, I don't know why she's not calling. And I said, you know, she's not from the bayou. Maybe she don't know. I said, I'm going to call her. And he looked at me. Oh, I love Jules. He was best man in my wedding. He said, Brune. He always kind of talked like that. You're going to put yourself lower than dirt <laughs> to call a girl. And I went, I'm going to call her. So I did. I called Vic. See, I tell you something embarrassing, then you're not going to. It's all about Jesus. And I called her. And I laid it flat out. I said, why haven't you called me? And she said, I don't call boys. I said, what? You expect me to call you. You expect Dennis Brunet to call a girl. She said, only if you want to talk. <laughs> and we hung up. And I turned around and around and I told Jules, I got to call her. To which my... Best buddy said, Brunei, your Lord in a snake's belly. <laughs> and so I called. And 
I said, all right, here we go. Then I found out she wouldn't date me. Well, why? Because the Bible says you're not to be yoked together with a non-believer. You know you marry the people you date, right? So you start right. So what's the point? Where have we come in this message? And I knew it would take me 45 minutes to give this message. I was going to go for 42, but y'all were slow at the beginning. <laughs> so God, Jesus knows all about our past. And there's not a person in this room that Jesus Christ can't forgive and save and restore. So my part to you is what is Jesus calling you today?